Hi, I'm Bonnie Stern, and I'm a home cooking warrior. <laughs> I'm beginning to think that there's an actual war against home cooking, and I'm really worried that home cooking could be losing the battle. We live in a world of food. Everyone's a foodie. Everyone watches food on TV. Everyone has a favorite trendy restaurant. And everyone has an Instagram account and posts pictures of their food. <laughs> but you know, this wasn't always the case. Let me take you back to 1969. In 1969, that was the year I graduated from University of Toronto. I wanted to be a librarian, and I was going to go to grad school. And then I just had this idea that I wanted to take a year off and do something more practical. And then I would go back to grad school. So I thought about what I liked to do, and I loved to read, and the only thing I liked to do besides read really was eat and cook. So I found a culinary arts program at George Brown College that I thought looked really good. But in those days, if you graduated university, you didn't usually go to a community college. And when I told my father, Max Stern, my plan, he said, now Bonnie, you go back to university, you go to grad school, and then you can take cooking classes and cook as a hobby. So I went to George Brown College. <laughs> and I fell in love with food. There were six people in my class, and now there's 800. Who could have known I would be in the right place at the right time? So now let's go to 1973. I opened up a little cooking school at Young and Erskine in Toronto. Now, Toronto wasn't exactly a food city back then. In fact, we had very few restaurants. If you wanted fresh ginger root, you had to go down to Dundas and Elizabeth. Nobody, I don't know if you'll believe this, but no one had ever heard of balsamic vinegar, sun-dried tomatoes, or quinoa. <laughs> and if anybody had told us that sushi, sashimi, ceviche, or tuna tartare would be the next big thing, nobody would have believed it. But the funny thing was, in those days, people cooked. They didn't cook that well, and they didn't have any fun cooking, but they cooked. And then I came along, and I made cooking fun. I taught people all the fancy French dishes that I learned in chef training. But I also taught them the comfort food that I had when I was growing up. And one of the most popular recipes that I taught was my mother's apple cake. My mother made this apple cake every Friday night, and the house smelled like cinnamon and apples and vanilla. And it was so incredibly delicious, but it was so easy to make that all my students were making my mother's apple cake. And in those days, this is how we served the apple cake. On a plate, and that's my mother's plate, by the way. On a plate with some ice cream if you wanted to make it fancy. But now, this is 2016, and everybody's a foodie. So let me show you how I served the same delicious apple cake at my house last week. And of course, everybody took a video. So I drizzled a platter with some salted caramel sauce. Then I drizzled it with a little bit of lightly whipped cream. I took the pieces of apple cake and positioned them on the platter kind of around where people were sitting. And then I sprinkled something crunchy over the top like caramelized almonds and put some strawberries around each piece of cake, so it sort of kept everything in a section. And then put some more sauce and stuff like that on top. And the most amazing part of this dessert was that at the end of the meal, everybody gathered around, and they ate off the same platter, and it brought the whole dinner party together again. 
and it was like magic. And it was really delicious. <laughs> so even though we've come so far now, and even though we're so enthusiastic about food, I have some questions. Are we cooking more, or are we just watching people cook on TV? Are we using the recipes and tips we learn from reality cooking television shows? Or are we just being entertained by chefs fighting with each other with knives and fire? <laughs> and are we learning more about the important social food issues of today? Things like sustainability, things like fish farming, things like food labeling and food safety, things like world hunger and hunger in our own communities? Or are we just more interested in the next celebrity chef? And is home cooking losing its potential to be the solution rather than the problem? So let me tell you a little bit about comfort food and home cooking. I learned a really big lesson about comfort food and home cooking from my son in 1991 when he was in grade two. Mark was a little bit of a fussy eater and he had taken a peanut butter sandwich, and you could do that then, to school for lunch since nursery school every single day. I was starting to feel like a terrible mother. So one day, I thought I'd make him a cheese sandwich, a cheddar cheese sandwich. He loved cheddar cheese. Well, when he came home from school that day, he put his little hands on his little hips. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, when I want to change, I'll ask for it. <laughs> and then he said, Mom, school is tough enough. I need a lunch that I can depend on. <laughs> You'll be happy to know that now Mark eats everything and he has a food block. And he did that video. Now, kids are fussy eaters, but adults are fussy eaters too. And it's hard to have people over for dinner without someone saying that they're vegetarian, pescatarian, flexitarian, vegan, gluten intolerant, lactose intolerant, eggplant intolerant. <laughs> Whatever happened to, thanks so much for the invitation. I'm so happy I'm not cooking my own dinner tonight. So there's a lot of excuses that people make not to cook at home. And one of the big ones is that they don't have time to cook. But I think that if you don't have time to cook, you're choosing the wrong recipes for the amount of time you actually have. I have to tell you a secret. Home cooking is really easy. It's not easy to be a chef in a restaurant where you're cooking 200 meals a night. But if you're making dinner for yourself, your friends, or your family, whatever you're studying at university, whatever you do for a living, it's harder than what I do, which is home cooking. Hmm. Sorry. I have a recipe for you now. I have a recipe for salad niçoise. Does everybody know salad niçoise? It's a wonderful Mediterranean salad. And it's so easy to make. And you can please even the fussiest eaters. You just use lettuce, roasted potatoes, green beans, tomatoes. And you can add whatever you like. Carrots, asparagus is coming into season. That would be a wonderful thing to add to it. And you can make this vegetarian just with the eggs on top. Traditionally, it might have tuna on top. But now I always serve the protein separate so that people can choose what they want. So sometimes I serve it with tuna. Sometimes I serve it with fish. Sometimes I serve it with a steak. Sometimes I serve it with chicken. 
depending on who's coming over for dinner and what their needs are. But it looks so beautiful and it's really so easy to make. And I know that all of you can make that salad, every single one of you. Now I want to talk to you a little bit about home cooking and obesity. Last month, I saw an article in the paper that there were 104 noted causes of obesity, which ranged from video games to low-fat cookies. But the, the one reason that really resonated with me is the lack of family meals. And it's almost impossible to believe how much salt, fat, and sugar goes into processed foods, takeout foods, and even good restaurant foods, especially, and especially fast foods. Ask any chef what love is, and they'll say butter. <laughs> if you cook at home, and I cook at home, I'm not afraid of butter, or sugar, or salt, or fat, because I can control how much of that I put in my food. But I know that if I'm on vacation and eating out three meals a day, or even if I just eat out a couple of times a week here in Toronto, I'm going to gain weight if I'm not careful. We only need 2,000 calories a day, but we eat double that. Eating less is bad. Excuse me. Eating less is bad for the food business. So they keep inventing all these ridiculous new foods that we absolutely need to eat for good health. Ask any nutritionist, Jamie Oliver, Michael Pollan, how to have a healthy diet. And they'll tell you, it's easy. Just eat more fresh fruits and vegetables and less processed foods. It sounds really easy and straightforward. But food advertising and convenience is really hard for people to resist. Let me take you to Calgary in 2006. I was on a book tour for one of my Heart Smart books, and I was in a call-in show on the radio. And I kind of love call-in shows, and I love being able to help people. I sort of always thought of myself as a social worker in the kitchen, kind of, sort of. And so a woman called in. Everything was going really well. And then a woman called in, and she said, so Bonnie. I really want to change my diet, and I want to eat more healthfully. What's the healthiest oil I can use to fry my french fries? <laughs> so I said, I've got such a great idea for you. Why don't you roast your french fries instead of frying them? Just take your potatoes, toss them with a little bit of olive oil, salt and pepper, maybe some rosemary and thyme, spread them on a baking sheet, put them in the oven at 400 degrees for about 40 minutes, and they'll come out brown and crisp and wonderful. And she said, oh, Bonnie, that sounds so delicious. I'm going to make that tonight for dinner. And just when I thought I was really changing her life, she said, but Bonnie, what's the healthiest oil? I should use to fry my donuts. <laughs> There's the donuts. So I have one last story for you, last story for you. And this is about home cooking as a way of breaking down barriers and bringing people together. Last August, I was asked to teach a class to medical students and young doctors from the Middle East. They were in Toronto on a one-month program at Hospital for Sick Kids in Pediatric Emergency Medicine. So they came to my house, there was about 12 of them, and we cooked this amazing meal together. Here's a photo of them starting to cook the meal. And then we went to the backyard because it was a beautiful night, and we had a delicious dinner. They were so proud and they were so happy with what they had done. And after dinner, we sat around the table, and everyone told their story about how they ended up at medical school and in Toronto on this project and how they were chosen for it. These kids were from Gaza, from Israel, and Jordan. And most of them had never met anybody from outside their own country before. 
By the end of the night, we were laughing and we were crying and we were hugging each other. And it was really an example of how powerful home cooking can be. So this was my journey with home cooking. But this is what I wish for you. I know you're busy studying or working or both, but take a break. Let's say, what are you doing next Wednesday night? Cook something. Cook my mother's apple cake. Cook the salad niçoise. Cook your mother's apple cake. That's even better. Invite someone over for dinner. Put away your phones. OK, take a picture of the food and then put away your phone. <laughs> Listen to their story. Tell them your story. And if you do that, you will become a home cooking warrior too. Thank you. <laughs>